the reason why I uh, wanted to interview you is uh, because I saw in the ballerina website that the language pretends or claims that it is a data-oriented programming language. And I just uh, finished my book, the manuscript of my book called Data-Oriented Programming. And uh, I was, I'm curious to see if what I think about data-oriented programming is the same as what ballerina thinks. Uh, yes, I think I saw, I, I uh, we originally made contact, I think I saw, I saw a tweet or I saw somebody retweet something about your book. And then I, I, I was, that sparked my interest because as, as you said, I think of ballerina as being data oriented. And I thought, oh, okay, here's a guy who's doing, using the same words. And I wonder if those, he's using the words with the same meaning as, as we are. Yeah. And uh, so I had a little look at your book and found there was quite a, uh, some interesting differences, but also quite a lot of overlap, I think. Yeah, and, and, and same for me, when I, when I wrote the book, I thought that uh, Clojure was the only data-oriented programming language. I've been doing Clojure for 10 years. Oh, really? And... 10 years of Clojure? That's, that's, that's quite yeah. a lot. And in does, 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 book... does Clojure, sorry, does Clojure describe itself as being data-oriented, yes. or is that something you've... Yes, yes, yes. If you, if you, if you Google the term data-oriented programming, you will find almost nothing. That's quite quite funny, and only the the first reference of this term is in in closure uh, pitch. Uh, for I, I certainly remember reading reading some of um, uh, Rich what's it, Rich Hickey is it some yeah. of his writings about closure and and some of some of what he says definitely resonated resonated with me. Although I, I don't remember the details anymore, but yeah, I've read so many things over the years that it's hard to know what came from where. But I certainly remember reading about closure and thinking this was pretty interesting. And and when, when I when I was near the end of the writing of the book, I had this feeling or these questions that even closure is not exactly data oriented programming, and something is still missing. And to me, it has to do with this uh, war, let's say, between statically typed languages and dynamically typed languages. So closure is dynamically typed and it, it brings lots of flexibility hmm. when we manipulate data. But on the other hand, it, it brings some limitation when we want to know what data we have at end. And over the last, I don't know, five years or so, the closure community has done lots of effort to, to find solutions to, to that. And one of the things that I like to, for us to get into the more details later is how ballerina tackles this question. Is ballerina a dynamically typed language? Uh, a statically typed language, does it bring something new? But let's, let's put a hold on it for now. And I'm curious about how you got involved in this, uh, in, in ballerina, what, what, what exactly you do at ballerina? Did you design the language? Do you write the language? Do you write alone? Do you have a team? Over the period of my involvement, I think the probably the part that has changed the most through my involvement has been precisely the type system. Because mm. my, mm -hmm. my background, my, 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 I should say, maybe my, 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 I'm not primarily a programming language person. I'm a, I'm say I'm more of a text processing person, I guess, but I'm probably, uh, I've done a lot of work in, in SGML and XML, um, which is, you know, a way of representing data. Uh, and probably the thing I've done most on, so I've, I've, I've done XSLT, which you can think of as a, a dynamic functional programming language, dynamically typed, functional programming language operating on XML documents. That's effectively what it is. Um, it's probably one of the most widely used functional programming languages out there, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. We don't think of it that way, but it is, it is, it is, a, it is a functional programming language. Can you say a few words about what is uh, XSLT? For people oh, sorry, XSLT is uh, uh, XML style suite language transformations. So, so an XSLT, is used more as a, a as a way of a general purpose way of transforming. Can you XML, give an example? Declarative of, way. Sorry. An example of where XSLT is used or was used 
a classic. Oh, yeah, I mean, whenever you need to transform, whenever you have XML data and you want to transform it from one format to another, people use XSLT or they use XQuery, which is not a million miles away. And it doesn't require code, right? It's you well, it is code. It. it is code, but it is it's code in XML syntax. Yeah, but it's not XML code. syntax. It's so it's it's, it's, a, it's a, but it's really a. Really, it's a function. It's 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 not. Users don't realize it, but it is actually a little functional programming language. Um, that operates that is specialized for, for XML. So, so just to continue, so, so anyway, so there was XLT, and then there was, uh, I was involved with XML, uh, various XML schema languages, particularly uh, uh, RelaxNG, which is a, uh, <clears throat> which is an, well, it's an XML, it's an XML schema language. So it's a way of, it's uh, an XML schema language is effectively a type system for XML. Okay. Uh -huh. So okay, let me. So, that, so I'm I I come from a background of yeah. thinking about and, and what one of the things you want to do when you're typing XML uh, or you're doing a schema for XML is you you you're wanting to uh, decouple the typing of the description of the data from how that data is going to you, you want I mean the 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 goal of XML is reusable the holy grail of if I can use that word for something, <laughs> is the holy grail of XML is reusable data. Um, so when you create your data, you have a, a, a schema that you want to, and, and the XML community is very big on having, you know, your beautiful data and it's, and it's correct and it captures information in a reusable form. And so you want to have a, a, a schema that describes what your XML data should look like that's independent of any particular program that is going to process that data because you know, the whole point of XML is you're trying to create your data once and then reuse it for, for multiple applications. So let me summarize what, what I got and tell me if I got you right. So we have XML as a da data representation language. Yes. We have XSLT as a data transformation language. Yes. And we have XML schema as a data validation language. Yes, yeah, so, so you can think of it as a type, as a, as a as a type system, as a way of describing types. Type system. A way of describing XML types. Okay. So you 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 had lots of knowledge and you were involved in many different aspects of XML. Did you contribute to XML itself? To the yes, to the I, I thought I, I, that I can claim credit for the name XML. Uh huh. What is the name actually? What is the? It's X is for extensible, extensible markup language, which was uh, um, yeah, so that it was it was a subset of SGML. So yes, I was I was involved in the birth of XML. When was it? What years are we talking about? Ninety oh goodness me, 1996, I think. So you were involved at the beginning in terms of of uh, changing the the specs of the language, or yeah. Well, when I got involved, there wasn't a specification. What I came in to try and do was to take what been, and, and what had been done had been that sort of evolved over time. So what I was try, what I tried to do was look at the entire language and and turn it into a coherent a coherent whole with a you know writer specification as as one's going writer. I think write, often writing something down makes it clear where you've understood it and where you've not understood it. So trying to understand the whole language as it, as it existed and then evolve it into something that uh, was more that, that, you know, what I felt was more that, that seemed cleaner, basically clean it up, well, you know, clean what's clean and what's not clean is to some extent a, a, a personal matter of personal judgment, but basically turn it into something that I felt was more clean and more of a, more of what a, a good programming language should look like. Mm -hmm. And part of that was also uh, making the type system um, more, uh, more coherent and more, more solid. Okay, just before we dive into the details of the, of the type system, why, why uh, so can you say a few words about the company WSO2 and why did they invest in, in creating a new programming language? Well, that's a, 
That's a very good question, um, which doesn't have a short answer, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think the background to uh, Ballerina is, is, you know, WSO2 has been producing um, enterprise middleware software for more than 15 years. And the, the current sort of main, the way that had been evolved for doing this is, is, is principally the ESB was really the kind of the workhorse of the enterprise service bus was really the workhorse of, uh, of enterprise middleware. And that, that is typically a, a server written in Java that has an, an XML configuration, so basically an XML DSL. Uh, as, as its configuration language and can also have, I guess you can call them plugins that are written in Java to have, uh, you know, when you can't express something declaratively in the XML, you have to go down to Java to get things done. And then you have the productively has uh, a, a graphical interface to edit the XML DSL. So you've got it, you've got, you've got a, a, a comp and it has a nice, it has pretty pictures, um, Typically, data flow style diagrams to show you, uh, to give you a nice, a nice, pretty interface for simple stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's the way that's the way people have been have typically done things, but it doesn't really scale up very well to the world. I mean, one problem is it doesn't work very well with the cloud. You don't want to think of having servers that you run on on and you, and you pay per server license or anything. And that really doesn't work in a, in, a, in a cloud environment. And the cloud environment is very much based on you want to have you want to have source code, you want to put it in GitHub, you want to deploy that source code, that source code to the cloud, all that sort of programming language goodness, you really want to be able to make use of for writing your enterprise integrations. And it doesn't that doesn't really work with the ESB approach. So it's kind of I guess the, the big idea was let's take, and so that's one problem, I guess. And, and the other problem is that you've got this dual, you're working in this dual language um, mode where you have some things in Java and some things in XML. And that you've got the nice graphical model for XML, but then that disappears when you go in Java. Yeah. Similarly, that you've got this sort of dis, you've got this big disconnect, whether it's debugging or it's or it's or it's the graphical interface. There's there's these two different worlds, and you have to kind of switch between them, and that leads to a, a less than ideal experience. So, so I think the big, well, the big when you have the little things like uh, little application, but when it scales and it yes, yeah, so it doesn't really scale. Up. Then, I guess another right. Another point is that the data flow model doesn't really scale. The, the kind of diagram model works for little demos. But the diagram sort of doesn't doesn't really work for bigger cases. So it doesn't. There's a scaling issue too. These things you often you start off with little things and they become bigger, and it that it doesn't sort of scale up. One of the nice things about programming languages is they have a whole bunch of stuff to control complexity that allows them to. I mean, modern programming languages they have a whole bunch of stuff. There's module systems, mm -hmm. uh, version all, all sorts of stuff that makes helps you to create abstractions that can control complexity. Yeah. And that's I, that's missing. Me, that's missing in the ESP world. So, <clears throat> so the big I think the big idea is enterprise integration would be better done by a programming language. Mm -hmm. And but some of the abstractions that you have in the ESP, their abstractions for dealing with the network, higher level ways of dealing with certain things, you want to have those abstractions in your programming language, and then you can do it all with one language. And you want the graphical aspect of the thing too in the programming language. So you've got one unified world in which you can solve all the all your enterprise integration problems. That's, that's the, the idea. I guess the other part of your question is, why can't you do it on top of some other programming language? Yeah, I, I guess you could probably, but uh, it makes yeah, sense. But it's, I think it's I think it's difficult because you don't you can't. Well, I think that I mean I can give you a long answer to that question, but uh, no, I think it makes sense to to try to to make a to create a language that is designed to solve 
to solve this kind of, of issues of uh, uh, making it easy. But going, but, but going back to the, the, the uh, just point about being data oriented, I think one of the things that, one of the reasons for having a, a new pro, a, a, a program and language just for this is data orientation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because most popular programming languages today are not data oriented. And actually, when you're focusing on the kind of problems that we're trying to solve here, you want a language that is data oriented. So I think yeah. that is that is actually one of the, the reasons for doing a new language is existing languages. So existing languages are not data oriented. Mm -hmm. The other part, which perhaps we won't go into today, is, is that you want the networking abstractions. And another part I think is is the way concurrency works. But again, that's another big discussion, which which I don't know if I can have time for today. Okay, so let me summarize. So we need for this kind of, of, of programs, we need good abstractions. We need support, native support for data orientation, and we need concurrency. So let's talk about the data orientation types. So first let's clear, let's make sure we are on the same page. What what I mean in my book uh, by data orientation, it means that it, if I would summarize it in one word, it, we could treat data as a first class citizen. It should be, uh, it should feel natural to manipulate data as it feels natural to manipulate number. So when you create a number, you don't instantiate a number, even in Java, you just, create a number. So you have literals for numbers and you just manipulate numbers and it feels very natural. But when it comes to manipulate data, you need to create a hash map and to, see, to, to specify the types of the keys, the type of the values. And, and there is lots of ceremony around it. And, and it's very, very rigid. Uh, so that's how I see it. I'm curious to see. Yes, how you... I, I think that's. I'd say that the point about I, I distinguish what one might call plain data. So what in C, C plus plus, I think even in Java they call it pods, plain old data, is the C plus plus world for it. I think they just added. I just somebody just showed me they've done something similar in in uh, Java eighteen. Is it with with uh, record types? Mm -hmm. um, but the concept is it's just data. There's no, you're not, whereas with objects you have, you are tying your code to your data. With data, it's the opposite. It's just data. There's no, and it's data that can be, that is separate from the code that operates on it. Yes. So that's, yes. I guess that's my XML. You're, you're kind of, the, the, the idea of, I mean, I guess one of the big ideas in XML or SGML really, is you're separating your document from your presentation. That is, you're separating the information from what you're going to do with it. Yeah. And so similarly with data orientation, for me, it's very natural. You're, you're separating out your information from the processing of the information. Yes. And you could do that in Java. You could have a class with Ooh, only so data members, but it feels awkward. It's all, it's, it's painful. Yeah, and it's not, that's not the way. That's just, you know, there's nothing wrong with object orientation. I mean, that's, that's a way of looking at the world that's a very attractive, persuasive way that's been tremendously successful. But I think it's not, it's not ideal. I mean, it, it's good if you've got these very tightly coupled monolithic systems. But when you've yes. got, when you've got a more of a, a more decoupled world and when you're, and especially when you've uh, got a world where you have, where any uh, solution is going to be composed of multiple services, that's, in my view, not, not the right way to approach things because these services, a key part of this is going to be your services exchanging messages. Mm -hmm. And those messages are data. They need to be data. If you try and send do Corba or whatever, it just doesn't, being there, done that doesn't work. You want to, what do you want to send over the network is 
data. So I think there's a concept, there's a what I call plain data. You briefly think of it as as network. You know, it's it's inherently network friendly data. You can deserialize it. You can copy it. It's you know, it's just a number. I can send you a number over the network in JSON. And you, I don't have to agree with you anything about it. It's just it's just a data, right? Yeah. And similarly, I think, I think the reason why JSON has been so successful is that it that that is what JSON is. It's just data. It's it's maps. It's lists. It's numbers, it's strings. And you can actually, I, I think it, it, that is a very attractive, simple way of modeling a lot of information that's enough to, to express a lot of things. Um, okay. Sorry, go ahead. So let's go the, to the other edge. So Java, Java and all this family of languages is not appropriate. What about the other families of language like JavaScript? Well, JavaScript, I think it doesn't, it doesn't have, JavaScript itself doesn't have types and it's very, it's very, it's super extra dynamic. I mean, everything is just, it's, it, it's very hard to uh, uh, analyze anything in Java. And I uh, could so, so Java, so sorry, JavaScript. So JavaScript, firstly, JavaScript, the language is object oriented. So it doesn't have this data orientation at all. Um, JavaScript itself doesn't have types. There's of course TypeScript, which has done a, a fantastic job of building a type system, a very nice type system on top of uh, JavaScript. But still the underlying language is, is object oriented and it's typeless and it's super dynamic. It's, it's more dynamic, it's so dynamic, you really can't, it, it's very hard to statically yeah. guarantee anything. And but in, in, the terms world of, of the, in terms of the easiness to create data with just curly braces. Yeah, it's nice. That's it's nice in that way. That 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 that's a great aspect of it that you have these literals that can construct complex structures in a very nice way, and you don't have to because it's dynamic. You can do that without worrying about types. You just put the little there. You send it out. There's, there's no there's no ceremony involved, and that that's a that's an awesome feature of it. But I think when you're trying to do um, a larger application, especially an application that has, um, it's not just a, a one, one team, it's got, you've got multiple teams involved. I think not having types is, is, is making life harder for oneself than, than necessary. I mean, both in terms of, you know, to validate, but just in terms of tooling, there's so much, I mean, there's so much awesome tooling available these days you know, with VS Code and IntelliJ or whatever. But if you don't have types, you're, you're, well, if you don't have types, you tend to make them up. You, you stick them in comments in your, <laughs> you know, that seems to what happened these days to dynamically type languages. People make up little type systems and they put them in comments just so that they can get all the nice stuff from the IDs, right? So, I mean, it's just the reality of the system, the, the reality of, of, of the world today is, Without types, programming is just much harder than it needs to be. But on the other hand, you don't want you don't want the rigidity that comes from uh, a type, the kind of type system you have in in Java. It, so it sound, but it, to me, it seemed like an unsolvable problem. And you need to choose what do you want more? Do you want more the the type system, the, the safety of the type system, but then you are stuck with the rigidity? Or do you want the flexibility of dynamically type languages like JavaScript, but then you are stuck with living in the wild? So I'm curious yes, I think, and I think, that, that, I think that has been the case, but I, I think I particularly highlight TypeScript, I think is a very good, and these languages that are built on top of, of JavaScript because they are, they, they are, they're trying to allow you to take an existing body of JavaScript code and existing idioms that people use in dynamically typed languages and describe that using the type system. So there's, there's TypeScript and there's Flow from, from uh, Facebook, I think. And they both have, have very nice, flexible type systems. And I think you had to pick of existing widely used languages the language that ballerina is close to the ballerina type system is closest to i'd say was was typescript or, mm -hmm. or, or flow that plays also pretty similar okay 
So, so tell, tell me more about how, how Ballerina, I think it's, I saw in the website of Ballerina, they call it a flexible type system, which, which seems to me like the holy grail of data oriented programming because you are not static, not dynamic, but flexible. So, but what does it mean concretely? Um, so I think one thing it means, so I think, I think it's, it's partly it's looking at types. I would say it's looking at types in a slightly more, I think there are a number of ingredients. One is it's looking at types in a slightly more schema-like way. So you're not, if you think about how XML works, you can, you can create your XML document, or at least, at least in the relaxing, or you can you can create your document, your JSON document, and you can independently have a schema that describes that. So the type and the data are are more decoupled. And data, there's not one type that a bit of data uh, has. The type is a way of class. A type is a way of classifying your data. A lens through which you look at the, or it, it's a structure, a con conceptual categorization that you impose on the data. It's not inherent in the data. So there can be any bit of data can be categorized in different ways, and depending what you want to do with it. Um, different categorizations will be appropriate. Okay, so let's 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 try to to make it concrete with an example, and I, I would start with an example from the number land. So if I have a number, forty two, <clears throat> I am not instantiating a, a, an even number whose value is forty two. I have the number forty two. And independently of that, I could say, okay, it belongs to the family of even numbers, but it also belongs to the family of positive numbers. And it also belongs to the family of numbers greater than 40 and to the family of numbers less than 50. And none of them has the right to say it's, it's mine. Yes, right? and we actually, that, I mean, numbers is an interesting example. And uh, so a little example that shows how Ballerina does things a little bit differently is in terms of different types of integers. So if you think of uh, C or Java, you have a whole bunch of different integers, integer types. You have, you know, you have char, you have char, you have short, you have int, you have long, and they're all different. And an int 42 and a short 42 and a long 42 are different things in that, mm -hmm. in that world. Um, and you, you're supposed to be clear about which one it is you're creating and, and they're all different. In the ballerina world, we, we, that, that's not the case. We have our byte type is just an integer that's in the range naught to 256. So the number 42 belongs to the int type. It belongs to our byte type. It belongs to our... Mm -hmm unsigned 16 type, it belongs to our signed 16, it, you know, it belongs to a whole bunch of different types. There's not one type, it's not inherent in the data. There's the data and there's the type you want to impose on it. And, and, and these are separate, these are separate things. And, and so when I write a function that expects a short number, let's say, then if you pass me 42, it will work. But if you pass me a huge number, it won't work, right? The function. Yes, well, I will say, I mean, you, if you've asked, if you said this number accepts a byte and you try and pass it um, 500, it will say, the compiler will say, sorry, 500 is not a, is not a byte because it's not an integer in the range 0 to 255. So, so types belong more to functions than to or to code than to or to, to data manipulation than to more than to data creation. 
when you create yes, data. Yes, I think you that's it's 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 more yes, I think that that's fair. It's more to types and more to do with um, processing the data. You know, when you want to process a data in a particular way, that's then that process requires that your data have some type. It's a contract, if you like, that your okay. data must satisfy in order for it to be processable by this type. But there are lots of processes you can do on one bit of data, and each of them have their own independent type. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and how does it look like with non-primitive type, with aggregating types in the ballerina? So it does the same thing. So um, there's a little bit of in inspiration from, from Jason here and that fundamentally we have, we have simple values. So roughly you know, booleans and strings and numbers and null, and then we have structural values. And we have two kinds of structural value. We have we have lists, which are ordered sequences of values, and we have uh, maps, which are um, values associated with string keys. Okay. Um, but one, I think, interesting, maybe unusual aspect of ballerina is that. Um, Let's take let's take mappings. A mapping value, which is just uh, an association between strings and other values, can be typed in a variety of different ways. So one kind of value, you can say it's a map of int, and what that means is it's value the the the, the values in that map or ints. But equally, you can say uh, it's a record with a field x and value in a uh, value float and a field y with value float. You, so your record type, a record and a map are just types. They are ways of classifying mappings. So mm -hmm. you can say, uh, what I need is a mapping where the values are in. Or you can say what I need is a mapping which has key X and key Y. And then you can also have things like that are more schema-ish things. So you can say, look, I need a mapping that has at least a key X and a key Y. And key X has to be an in and key Y has to, the value of key Y has to be an in. And it can have other stuff and I don't care about that. Or you can say, it's got to have exactly, it can have just those two keys and nothing else. And then you have unions. So you can say, okay, I need a record that's got a, an X and a Y, or I need an int, or I need a uh, nil. Or I can say I want an X and a Y, uh, or I want um, something that has an X, a Y, and a Z. So you just, your, your types just describe a more descriptive, they're, in, they're just describing the kind of data that a particular uh, process needs. And Tell me if I'm wrong, but it will allow me to, on the one hand, write generic function, not generic, but general functions like in JavaScript, for example, a function that count the number of fields in a map. Yes. And this function, I don't care what map you give me. It just needs to be a map. I don't care about the, the fields, like in JavaScript. And on the other hand, I could write a function like in Java that say I expect a map with key X and Y, and I will return you the sum of the yes. value associated to X and Y. Right, you can create a record, you can create a mapping value, and you can pass it to, you can, you can create it as a record, and then you can look at it as a map, and it is both, the same thing is both a record and a map. I mean, it's both okay. a, if you create a, a, a mapping that has a, a field X and a field Y, that are, it, it's both, you know, it, it has both, uh, it has a whole bunch of different types. For the people who listen to us, no matter if you come from Java or JavaScript, I think we have described something that is very hard to do in any language. And let me say it again, when you create data, you don't care if it's a map or a record, you just create data. And then some functions will look at the data as a record 
like in Java, and some function will look at data as a generic map, like in JavaScript. And it's, I think it's great to have this capability in the same language. So you have one that's language. That, that, that is what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to achieve. Okay, let's talk about the, the Ballerina programming style. When I write code in, in Ballerina, does it look like object-oriented programming code or functional programming code? Do I have the dot notation, A dot B, or do I call functions? How it looks, does it, look? it doesn't it doesn't look like um, okay, so first of all, Ballerina is designed, the syntax is designed to look like uh, programming languages in the C family. So if you look at popular languages today, the majority of them use C-like syntax. So C, C++, Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, Kotlin, TypeScript, they're all pretty similar syntax. And, and Ballerina is designed to, to leverage that familiarity. Um, so it, it looks like that kind of language. It's a curly brace language. Um, we have objects, but the, the, the kind of zen of Ballerina is not to use objects when you don't need them. So the, the zen of Ballerina, if you like, is to write functions and for those functions to have uh, arguments that are primarily plain data types. So records and maps and lists and combinations of those. And that what most functions do is, is take some data and do something with it and return some other data. Also, Ballerina is, is an imperative language. Um, so it, it gets things done by mutating stuff. Not because that is the best way to do things. It's not. I mean, the, it, you know, doing things in a more functional way is, 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 is objectively a better way to do things. But we're trying to be familiar and, and we're, we're targeting relatively small programs. So you can't say to some enterprise developer, look, to go integrate this legacy system with this system over there, you've got to go relearn a whole different way of doing programming. That's just not, not realistic. We want people to be able to leverage what they know. And, you know, there are, there are things that are different, but you should be able to write programs in a way that feels familiar if you mm -hmm. have written imperative programs in a C-like language, particularly if you've used a system with some sort of types. It's not going to feel, you should be able to look at a, a bit of code, even if you've never seen Ballerina before, and it should, oh, yeah, this looks pretty, I guess what you this do. looks not too weird. There'll be some, there's some weird stuff, but mostly it looks pretty obvious. I mean, I'm biased, so, yeah. um, but I, you, you've, you're relatively new to, to looking at Ballerina. Was your experience that if, when you came and looked at a bit of Ballerina code, did it, it look pretty, what was yes. your... Yeah, it was a. Uh, it was very. Uh, it feels very similar to JavaScript, even. I would yes. Say. Yeah, it looks pretty JavaScript. I had the type part, but I could easily guess what it means. I saw function receives, a, I don't know, user A and the consumer B and returns a boolean uh, something. Right. I mean, one of one of the ideas of Ballerina is that. Uh, code is read much more often than it's it's written, and one wants to think of think of the maintenance guy. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. of the maintenance programmer who comes along five years later to fix some problem in this bit of integration code. You know, he's not. He's just it's just a job. He's not. He's not. You know, and he uses lots of programming languages. This is just one of many programming languages he uses. He comes in, he's got half an hour, he wants to get home to his wife and kids, he wants to fix this, yeah. he wants to fix this problem. You know, think of that, think of that yeah. man or, or woman and, 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 you know, try and not make their life more difficult than it needs to be. And one thing that I saw and I was a bit confused is, for example, when I access the standard library for manipulating strings, let's say. So here there is the dot notation. Like my yes. string 
Don't that's, capitalize. That's just, that is just sugar for a function call, which we use to make the built-in types a little bit more familiar and convenient to, uh, to work with. So if I say, you know, x dot substring, that just is a, a, a call to a function in the built-in string module where the x is the first argument. So it's just a little bit of it's just a little bit of sugar to um, avoid you. Yeah, it's just a little bit of sugar to make things a yeah, little more compatible. I guess again, it it makes the code look more familiar to people. Yeah, who are but it's not. That's not object oriented. I mean, we, we use dot for object oriented stuff too, but. But that the dots you're saying there is not is just it's just sugar for for a function call, um, and we do we do have objects and and uh, they are crucial because they are the foundation of the network abstractions. Mm -hmm. We represent a service or a client as a kind of object, and that is, that is a case where I think object orientation is entirely appropriate because why why do service, we have your service is you know your service has state you're not sending your service. Across the mm -hmm. network, your service is just there. It's sending. There's a distinction between the service, which mm -hmm. is an object and has state, and the messages it sends. The messages are data. The service is inherently something that has code. So there, there's a place for mm -hmm. object-oriented stuff, um, a very important place. But it's it's where is that place that I think is important? And, so, and making a distinction, making a clear distinction in the language. And in the type mm -hmm. system between objects, I see. including code that are inherently not mobile, that are not network friendly, and data, which is independent of code and can be automatically serialized and deserialized, exchanged between people without pre agreement, without introducing coupling. Yeah, so, so you, you, we should not use object to represent the world. But we, we should use, or we could use object to implement our stuff. What about serialization and deserialization? Well, of that, data? That, that's, comes, that's part and parcel of the data orientation. When you have, so the, 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 the type system distinguishes between values that are plain data, we call it any data, and other mm -hmm. kinds of values. And any data values can automatically be serialized as JSON and read from JSON. And JSON is just one. I mean, it's, it's not JSON, the syntax that is important, but it's, it's having you know, numbers and strings and booleans and nil and lists and maps. It's that, which is not unique to JSON. It's shared by pretty much every, you know, whether it's Perl or Python or, you know, that is the magic set of things that, that, that actually is sufficient. Pretty much every language, I'm, I'm sure Clojure has, well, it's closed. Yes. Error. Almost every language out there has, you know, numbers, yes. booleans, strings, maps, lists. Right? Everything has it. And uh, so, describing having a language that works well with data that uses those structures and those kinds of values is not. A, it's not a JSON-specific thing. It's 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 um, it's just. You know, data is data is as part of being data oriented. I think dealing with dealing with these things. In terms of deserialization, so when I get a message from the wire, if I want to convert it to a map, it will work like uh, in JavaScript. But if I want to convert it into a record, and the data shape is not compliant with my record type, what what's what will happen? But that's all taken care of. That's 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 I think one of Ballerina's killer features is that. All you do is you you define your service, so you have an effectively a, a kind of your service is a kind of object. You write uh, a method to implement the service. You declare the type of the parameter, and that type is a, a record or a, or is typically a record. And then the the listener or the HTTP, assuming it's an HTTP service, the HTTP implementation takes care of validating that your JSON uh, has the right type and it will convert it and give you a value that belongs to that type. And if you and that all, just, all, you, all you have to do is you just, you just write your type, 
say you yeah. want the parameter of the type, and that's it. And if it doesn't comply, it would then be your, 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 your HTTP 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 implementation will give a whatever the number of an error when you try and uh, mm -hmm. great. And what about uh, Swagger? Will it be? Yeah, so you can generate. I mean, so, so I think for I think these days, I think that's that's open API. That's called open API these days, right? Is that, is that the same thing? Yes, yes. I think it is. Oh, yeah. Okay. So so the way that works is so I think the way we I think that the way the ballerina kind of recommended way would be code first. So you write your types as ballerina types. Um, you describe, uh, you, you write your services and you write your methods. And we have this, we have this, uh, one of the other nice features of ballerina is we have this concept of what we call a, a resource method, which is a better fit for HTTP than, 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 than the traditional object, object oriented method. So you'd write a resource method uh, that implements the service. And then from that, you can automatically generate the, um, the open API uh, description of your, of, of your service. So the, the types of the, of the, that you put in your parameters on turn value will turn into fragments of JSON schema. And the, the service object, that will be used to generate the, so I'm not very familiar with MNA, but the, whatever the, the yeah, open API service, that, service uh, interface. It's an HTML page generated that allows you to play with your REST API and it has all the endpoints and all the specification from the, for the schema of the endpoints. And it's really an amazing tool. So with Ballerina, I mean, you, you just, you just, you, you, you can, you have our, we have the type system and it's, it's, to me, it's a very, natural straightforward way to describe the structure of of your of your data i mean it looks pretty much like yeah it's not, not looks not dissimilar to to see types you have records and you have unions which are all and you have intersections which are and and you mm -hmm. and you have records and this and so, so it's, it's pretty straightforward and you write this type and once you've done that you just use it in your in your service definition and that works for uh, HTTP uh, and Swagger, but it also works for GraphQL. Mm -hmm. So you can that same syntax can be used to generate a uh, a, a GraphQL uh, service, mm -hmm. and it will generate a the the, the, implement, the, the the GraphQL implementation will generate a a GraphQL schema, and you can inspect on the service, and it will it will show you the schema for the data. So it's it, it's a I think it's a very nice and it, it and it, and the whole having having types just makes life you know, yeah. it just makes life so much easier. You just you and you don't have to you don't have to master all these different types indexes. You you just write it in Ballerina and people can consume it in you know whatever whatever language they want. And GraphQL actually is a great is a great way to do that because there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of different programming languages have GraphQL support, so you can get a nice by producing a GraphQL service in Ballerina. You can consume that very easily um, with a lot of different uh, languages. Yeah, so we we are coming to the end of our conversation, and but something I find very very interesting is what we discussed is like it's almost like Ballerina designers they look at all what is available in OOP, FP, statically typed, dynamically typed languages. And you guys cherry picked what, what features you want from here, from there, and build something coherent without, be, without the need to be fanatic about one paradigm. So yeah, I think that's, a, I would say we're not, we're, we, we try not to be, it's, I mean, I think part of the philosophy of Ballerina is pragmatism. Pragmatism, um, yeah. So, there are things in Ballerina that are not beautiful, um, but they are pragmatic. We picked, you know, there's object oriented, there's function ideas. I, you know, if you took the list of all the languages that have inspired Ballerina, it's 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 you know there must be a a, a couple of dozen languages that have inspired mm -hmm. little bits of little bits of Ballerina, and there's, there's so much good stuff out there, and, and and we've tried to craft something that. It turns it into a, a relatively coherent whole. I mean, it's 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 uh, 
Yeah, so but it is it is you know there are it does support it is not fanatic it's not fanatic about typing either. I mean there there, there are languages where that take the philosophy is that the more you can type, the better. The more you can catch with the static type system, the better. But that's very much not our philosophy. There's a there's a trade off between how complex the type system is and how much it helps you. And if you're writing relatively small programs. Um, then having a huge, having to master a hugely complex type system in order to get that little bit of code working isn't right. It isn't right. What you want is something where you don't have to have a super sophisticated understanding of the type system, and it's just enough to get things done. And if there are a few things that are caught at runtime, that's okay. Yeah. That's it's unsound, and um, you know, lots of type theorists will throw up there. <laughs> throw up their hands in horror. Your type system is unsound. Go home and try again. Um, but <laughs> I think a little bit of unsoundness can, can go quite a long way to making your type system simpler. And the goal of the goal, you know, having no type errors is not actually a particularly useful goal. I mean, so it doesn't have type errors, but you have lots of other errors. Yeah, yeah. so what? I mean, it's not, that's not particularly helpful. What you want is, you want to, and it's not just about errors, it's about IDEs, it's about generating such a generating graph, you're generating swagger, it's about tooling. So it's not just about catching errors, it's about how much complexity, how much, how much are you helping? What are you asking from the programmer? What are you demanding of the what does your type system ask from the programmer in terms of? the intellectual, the cognitive load that it imposes on the programmer to write those types? And what are you giving the programmer in return? So what, yeah. what you want is something where, you know, the, the type system gives you hopefully a lot more than it asks of you. Right? That, that's the way I, I, I kind of think of, think of the problem. That makes lots of, of sense. And it's uh, for having played a bit with Ballerina, it's, it's a refreshing um, it's re very uh, refreshing. I have a question about the implementation. How, what, in what language Ballerina is implemented? The, the, the current implementation is written in Java, but we've been, <coughs> that, is, that is purely an implementation uh, decision, uh, an, uh, uh, a temporary implementation decision that we try very hard not to expose. So it's very different from Clojure. With Clojure, the philosophy is embrace the Java platform. Yes. But with Ballerina, the philosophy is hide the fact that we're using the Java platform. So you don't have interop. You cannot code. Well, you did, we do, but you have to, you know, if you want interop, then okay, you can go do that. And then you are forever tied to Java. But our goal is to, as much as possible that you should be able to do things without exposing the, the directly exposing Java interfaces so that the, the long-term goal for Ballerina is that we have a native implementation where you can compile uh, JVM, where you can compile Ballerina code to native code um, uh, using LLVM as a backend. And, and we're working on a compiler that does that, which is written in Ballerina, which is an interesting experience. Um, or what is the idea of eat your own dog food or something like that? Yes, yes, it's it's well, it's it's, it's dog fooding. Yes, which I which has been actually very useful to uh, writing a, a really large program in Ballerina has been very useful to work out bugs and and language. Uh, do you still like just... Do you still like Ballerina after having? Yes, no, I do. I find it quite pleasant. I mean, it's not Ballerina isn't designed to be a language for writing compilers, so it's not. Yeah. It's not optimum for this, but it, it one can get it, it's it's quite pleasant to, to work with, and one can do it. It's it's maybe not it's not it's not an ideal language for writing a huge a huge system, um, but you know it's designed for maybe battering is maybe sweet spot is maybe we're talking you know five hundred lines, thousand lines, that sort of thing, and it, it can scale up to you know I think you could probably scale up to a you know a hundred thousand line program. I wouldn't write, I wouldn't want to write a million line program in Ballerina, but that's but I don't think anybody's going to, that's just not what it's designed for. Uh, and so where, 
to put things in scope where what is the availability of the language is it production ready is it free yeah so it's 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 so there's Valerian of the language uh, which is like a batteries included language so it has a, a whole bunch of standard libraries and it has visual <laughs> studio code plugged in and um and it has a test system and a build system and documentation system so every, everything you need and that <coughs> is all open source and uh, downloadable and, and free and the source code is all on github and that is we've just had um a big release of, of really what i would say is our first really high quality release um which we call swan lake and so we, we just had a few weeks ago the first release of that and that is that is i think a good that is now is the time to try it i think it's it's previous releases were were not not what i would have liked uh not at the level that i would have liked to see them at as this is the first one where i think we've really got a a, a something that represents the kind of vision that is a good i mean it's not every there's tons more we can do but i think what we've got is still is still quite a lot is a lot and i think if if now is a good time for people to look at ballerina and i think if you don't find anything interesting in ballerina as it is today then probably ballerina is not for you yeah. um so i think there's something i think there's enough there that i think it shows what we're trying to achieve with ballerina where people could uh, try ballerina you just go to ballerina.io and, and download it and uh, is there a, um, a, a if, if people have questions how can they reach out to, to you there's, to a, the there's a slack there's a, there's a slack channel uh -huh. um, and um, if you have problems in the implementation you can file a, a, a bug report Or mm -hmm. you can talk on the Slack channel if you want to. If you have some new feature you want to the language, you can open a GitHub issue. Um, uh, okay, and people are reactive. They, they, the 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 ballerina team they're reactive to. Yes, to yeah. On Slack, uh, there's, there's the Slack channel is. If you want an instant response, then the Slack channel is the place to to go for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm, I think we we cover the this high level introduction to ballerina and the, the value proposition and unique uh, features, and I, I'm really excited uh, and uh, thrilled by uh, having the opportunity to to discuss that with you, the the, the person behind uh, um, behind it or that implemented it and made the uh, changes into the, the directions and maybe the one that understand uh, the most the details and the, the philosophy. So thank you for. Um, it's been for, fun. Uh, uh, it's nice to, uh, I think you understand the, uh, the, the data oriented. I mean, I think the whole data oriented uh, worldview is not the, is not the dominant one in the, Software yeah. industry today. I think people tend to think in terms of more in terms of object orientation, but I think there's a lot. I think I think data orientation is a lot more natural for the way the world has been evolving. 